Liberty University professor Ron Miller in your book, Sell Out, Musings from Uncle Tom's Porch. You write that you smile when you're called an Uncle Tom. Why is that? Well, I smile because I understand what Uncle Tom was actually meant to be as uh, the author Harriet Beecher Stowe presented in her original novel. I think that over the years, both because of the way the character has been portrayed in minstrel shows and other things, that it's become distorted. But if you read the actual novel, uh, Miss Stowe meant for Tom to be an archetype of a Christ-like figure. And this was a person with great nobility, a person who actually died because he refused to divulge the whereabouts of some slaves that he helped to escape. And he forgave his assailants even as he was dying. And to me, that's a noble uh, character and one that uh, I embrace. And so when I hear that term, I just take it on and it confounds people. Um, but it also, if they're interested in learning more, I'm more than happy to tell them about the character. Your subtitle, well, the whole, ti whole title of your book, you've probably gotten some response to what you called your book. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The, the idea came about because a lot of times when you're a person of color, and you have uh, conservative political views, um, you get certain names that your mother never intended for you. <laughs> and um, rather than run away from that, I use it as the title because it grabs you. And then it sort of highlights one of the, the themes in the book, which is that if we're going to have an honest discussion in America about the topic of race, it needs to be multifaceted. It can't just be one-sided. And the book, in fact, uh, came about because of Eric Holder, the Attorney General, making the statement that we're a nation of cowards because of our uh, inability to discuss race. And at the time, frankly, I took exception to that comment because to me, if we can't have an honest discussion even within the black community about the topic, then how can we expect anyone else to speak candidly. And then I listed the names of all of the individuals who have gotten into trouble and inherited some of those names I talk about because they chose to be candid about the topic of race, personal responsibility, accountability, and how we look to the future rather than to the past. Who are some of those people? Well, Bill Cosby is probably the biggest example. You may recall at the NAACP black tie affair, he decided to use that opportunity to be critical of the current generation and their inability to take advantage of the gains from the civil rights movement. And he took a lot of flack for that, but he's unapologetic about it. He continues to speak out, uh, if not at these uh, fancy events at neighborhood churches and other venues across the country where he talks about the need for us not to let our circumstances define us, but to take charge and to be victors rather than victims. And that's not a message that resonates well within some circles. Uh, you have other people like Condoleezza Rice, Clarence Thomas, uh, people like Ken Blackwell, Niger Ennis, um, the list goes on uh, of people who are willing to present an alternative view. And because of this back and forth of name calling and other things, I felt the need to write about it, not just from a perspective of policies and pathologies and all of that, but a personal perspective. Because I was raised in a family where our beliefs and our values, the things we were taught, if you stripped away the whole issue of race, we would be considered conservative. But then our political allegiances didn't align with the values. And when I went away to college and I started to examine that for myself, I didn't understand that dichotomy. And eventually I started to, in my view, show a little more integrity from within by aligning my values with the way I practice my politics. And I think when people start understanding motivations and understanding the whys and the wherefores of things like that, um, then you begin to have the basis for a dialogue rather than a confrontation. And I spend a lot of time in the book not just talking about what I believe and why I believe it, but I also talk about why I think blacks as a community have certain views of the world, why they have uh, a particular position on one issue or another. And in doing so, trying to increase the scope of understanding. I, I'm a very big believer that if you sit down with the intent to understand and you don't use language that's going to immediately shut down the conversation, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Godwin's Law, which is uh, tell, talks about how long before an online thread of discussion devolves into someone calling someone a Nazi. 
you know, there's, there's, there's a, a, a certain thing that happens where a word that's thrown out there and all of a sudden there's no room for any further discussion. I'm trying to avoid that both in the book and in the way I approach um, people on a day-to-day -day basis. Having said that, if I sense that someone is being untruthful or deceitful, I, I confront that, at least as I see it. Ron Miller in Sellout, you talk about a year you spent living in Lake Charles, Louisiana, as one of the worst years of your young life. <laughs> Why? Well, as a military brat, growing up in integrated schools and not being accustomed to a school where uh, you had uh, predominantly black students, uh, student, student body, and the attitudes that came with it, um, here I am, a kid that dressed a certain way, spoke a certain way, had a certain level of respect for authority, and you put me into an environment where those kinds of things were not held in regard, and I was ridiculed, I was harassed, um, teacher's pet, acting white, um, talking like a white boy, all of these kinds of things were thrown at me. And the irony was the only reason I didn't get beat up was that these two white kids at the school uh, took a liking to me and defended me. Um, I'd say in the book that they were much bigger than anyone else. I think they might have been held back a couple of grades. But it was going through that experience and realizing that there was all this animosity uh, when it came to um, not just race, but the whole archetype of what it meant to be black. You know, I talk about what it means to be authentically black. And as someone who believes in uh, the dignity and worth of every individual and how that individual was made in the image of God, I really take exception to the idea that there is some kind of a standard out there that says this is what it means to be black and anyone who doesn't fit into this box can't possibly be black. You hear it even today in debates. Uh, Jesse Jackson a couple of years ago saying that you can't be against um, the president's health care plan and call yourself black. I said, well, why not? Last time I looked in the mirror, I think I qualify. So the whole experience I had in that one year was just a challenge to the whole notion of what it meant to be black. And as I said, I couldn't wait for my dad's next duty assignment to get out of there. When you hear the term post-racial, what does that mean to you? doesn't mean a lot. Um, I think it meant something when some of the more thoughtful writers that I read shortly after the election of President Obama um, discussed the possibility that now, finally, we can move forward because they recognized that this nation was capable of not only embracing blacks as Americans, but electing a black man to be the leader of the most powerful nation on the planet. So I was hopeful, but it didn't last long. And it's like a lot of things like uh, that that pop up. I think it had a lot more uh, theory behind it than actual uh, practical meaning. In your view, does a Republican Party have a responsibility to reach out to African Americans? Yes, they do. And I think they failed, to be quite honest. Um, I was very disappointed recently to hear that Representative Alan West from Florida had a uh, meeting on Capitol Hill with a group of black conservatives and he invited a representative from the Republican National Committee and they didn't show up. And while the pragmatic side of me understands that they feel that if they're going to invest time in building an electoral coalition, they probably aren't going to get a whole lot out of working in the black community. Um, one of the things I learned both as a person who's been in the political arena and run for office myself is that they're very much into a return on investment approach to dealing with voters. If they don't feel like they're going to get a quick and substantial ROI in going after a particular demographic, then they're just going to dismiss it and move on. And that's essentially what they've done with the black community. They've concluded that there is no fertile ground there, and I think that's a mistake. I think that they need to take a long-term view. I think they need to remember why the Republican Party was created in the first place, and they need to reconnect with black voters, not only politically but philosophically because I do believe fundamentally that the black community is a conservative community. I just believe that there are emotional issues that have clouded that relationship. Uh, and I, I also tell people they talk about the racist fr uh, fringe of the Republican Party. Well, I tell them that, yeah, you have the racist fringe, but then you have the soft bigotry of low expectations that I think permeates a lot of liberal views of the black community. Which one do you prefer? <laughs> And so in that regard, I think the Republicans have a responsibility to get a thick skin 
and at least at some level commit to trying to build relationships. Not that they're going to see any immediate returns in this election or the next one, but I know for myself, I feel a